this is a special edition of Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the premier financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Now, for this special edition of Macro Voices, here's hedge fund manager Eric Townsend. Macro Voices All-Stars episode number 35 was recorded on July 22nd, 2019. I'm Eric Townsend. All-Star Luke Groman is back with us today. Luke, what's caught your attention this week? Now, hey, Eric. Thanks for having me on again. It's great catching up. What's caught my attention recently has been the degree of confusion about why the Fed is still likely to cut rates next week, despite the, the better-than-expected job numbers three weeks ago, followed by last week's better-than-expected retail sales number. And you know, I've read a number of articles talking about how the Fed is cherry-picking data to arrive at the need for a rate cut. And what I find fascinating is that still virtually no one is discussing what we think is the real reason for the Fed cutting rates, which is that U.S. fiscal deficits are increasingly being financed by the U.S. domestic private sector. And as we've discussed in our last couple conversations, the true message of Fed funds rates going over interest on excess reserves back on March 20th, 2019, and staying there ever since is that the U.S. private sector does not have enough balance sheet to finance U.S. government deficits without the Fed's help. And so, you know, in our view, the Fed is cutting rates to provide that help to the U.S. private sector in financing U.S. government deficits. Luke, I'm glad you brought up this topic of Fed funds going over IOER. In last week's Macro Voices All-Stars discussion with Jeff Snyder, Jeff mentioned the importance of Fed funds going over IOER as well. I'm curious, Luke, did you happen to catch that interview? And what were your thoughts on one of Jeff's major conclusions that banks are afraid of something out there, which is the reason perhaps that Jeff speculates that they're not lending excess reserves into the Fed funds market to take advantage of what seems to be a risk-free arbitrage? I did listen to his interview, and, and I thought he was great and on point, as usual. And, and now, fully conceding that Jeff has likely forgotten more about the euro dollar market than I'll ever know, I, I did disagree with Jeff on, on just one key point he made. Okay. Which one was that? That the banks are not lending excess reserves into the Fed funds market because they're afraid of something. I, I think the reason they're not lending into the Fed funds market is much simpler than that. I think that they're, they're not lending excess reserves into Fed funds because the so-called excess reserves actually aren't excess reserves at all. They've, they've become required reserves effectively. What we think has happened is the banks don't have the excess reserves because either they or their customers, the depositors, have shifted cash into the treasury market, either directly or via investment funds or money market funds, government money market funds, to pick up what's essentially a free 200 basis points in yield by keeping cash in U.S. government money market funds instead of in a bank account that's earning virtually 0%. And so what this implies to us is that Fed funds is above IOER is a sign of lack of U.S. bank balance sheet capacity. And that then begs the question, why is this happening? And if we look at what primary dealer holdings of treasuries began doing in 4Q18, to us, the answer jumps off the page. And in 4Q18, primary dealer holdings of treasuries rose at a 500 to $600 billion annual rate. And in short, in 4Q18, the U.S. government was being financed in no small part by primary dealers is what this implies. And what this data suggests is that Fed funds uh, isn't persisting above IOER because the banks are afraid of something. Fed funds is persisting above IOER because the U.S. banking system is increasingly choking on U.S. federal deficits. You know, to us, the Fed funds over IOER is a sign that the U.S. banking system, and by extension, the U.S. private sector, is running out of balance sheet capacity to finance U.S. government deficits without help from the Fed. And, you know, tying it back to my initial point, this is why so many analysts are confused, we think, about why the Fed's cutting rates when recent key economic data looks pretty decent. You know, to us, what we think is happening is it's not about the economy. It's about money markets demanding that the Fed begin helping the U.S. banking system finance U.S. government deficits, or for short, money markets demanding that the Fed begin helping finance U.S. government deficits. And, and this, to us, seems highly unlikely that this dynamic will be risk asset deflationary over time. I just want to make a quick note for listeners that we've gotten quite a bit of feedback on that episode with Jeff Snyder. And in next week's uh, interview on All Stars with Jeff Snyder, we're going to take a deeper dive into Jeff's views and clarify some of the points that he made in the interview that you referenced. But I want to move on now. Why aren't more analysts aware of this? And what was the importance of 4Q18 in terms of why the primary dealers had to buy U.S. Treasuries 
at a 500 to 600 billion dollar annual rate in the fourth quarter of 18. I mean, global risk markets were coming unhinged in 4Q18. There should have been no problem with U.S. Treasury demand with what was going on in the stock market. So why did the primary dealers have to take down that much U.S. Treasury issuance? Those are great questions, Eric. You know, I think in terms of why aren't more analysts focused on on the U.S. fiscal problems being the driver of Fed funds over IOER and forcing Fed rate cuts, you know, effectively to finance U.S. government deficits, you know, we've called this dynamic Voldemort in our work after the main villain in the Harry Potter books and movies. And and the reason we've called it that is because like Voldemort in the early parts of the of the movies and books, everyone refers to Voldemort by he who must not be named for fear of summoning him back. And you know, then once he actually is back, he's at first only seen by Harry Potter and Dumbledore, two of the chief protagonists in the story for the uninitiated, and nobody else believes them that he's back. But eventually he's seen by a small quorum of other people, and once just a small quorum of other people see him, we go from virtually nobody believing that Voldemort is back to everybody knowing that Voldemort is back. And and we think the same thing's happening here. It's it's a little akin to 2004 or you know, 2005 maybe even when nobody believed that home prices could fall nationally. And then all of a sudden, everyone knew home prices were actually falling nationally. And so the U.S. fiscal problems went critical five years ago in 3Q14 when global central banks stopped sterilizing U.S. deficits. And since then, we've seen U.S. deficits shifted from being financed by the global official sector to being financed by the global private sector, driving the dollar higher and LIBOR higher as the U.S. government deficits effectively crowded out global dollar markets. And you know, this yields a critical but still underappreciated point, which is you know, the dollar didn't begin rising in 3Q14 because so many people wanted dollars. It began rising because central banks stopped stockpiling treasuries or stopped sterilizing U.S. deficits and began a process of crowding out dollar markets. You know, and that brings us to your question about what was the importance of 4Q18. And you know, I would point your listeners to a, a great article by John Dizzard in the FT uh, about this dynamic early October 2018. And in, in late 3Q18, regulators uh, apparently encouraged U.S. banks to stop growing their FX swaps books. And this FX swaps growth had allowed the foreign private sector to buy treasuries on an FX hedge basis and still earn positive carry. And what this amounted to was a suspension of covered interest parity, which in theory should never happen, but what in practice was. And basically where the dollar risk in that case effectively got piled up was on bank swap books. And so you know, once banks stopped growing their FX swap books or were encouraged to slow that growth in, in 4Q18, you can see it in the charts. FX hedge treasury yields quickly went negative in 4Q18, and that began shifting uh, a growing burden of financing U.S. government deficits from the global private sector onto the U.S. private sector, which explains why primary dealers grew their holdings of treasuries at a 500 to $600 billion annual rate in 4Q18, and which further explains why so many treasury auctions were as sloppy as they were in 4Q18. Because as you noted, the market, it was a big risk off time and yields were falling sharply on treasuries. But you had these you know, big tails on a number of treasury auctions in 4Q18 and you had falling or weak bid to covers, which you shouldn't have had all else that was going on. And so, like I said, in the midst of a sharp global risk sell-off, it was driving those treasury yields down sharply. You were having these sloppy auctions move forward to the first quarter, you know, Fed pausing hikes and then discussing rate cuts bought time in first half 2019. But the real message of Fed funds over IOER on March 20th, 2019, is that primary dealers ability to finance US government deficits at a 500 to 600 billion dollar annual rate was just not sustainable. It, it's going to require Fed help. And, you know, our view of, of what the Fed's message is, is that they're now saying that help is coming. Wow, Luke. So you're saying that the Fed is cutting rates effectively to finance U.S. government deficits. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what we're saying. You know, if we look at Fed funds over IOER in the context of both a lack of, of growing official central bank treasury bid since 3Q14 or treasury demand since 3Q14, and in the context of FX hedge treasury yields going negative, in 4Q18, and the pace at which treasuries have been piling up on primary dealer balance sheets that began in 4Q18. In our view, the message is clear. The the Fed is cutting rates to supply liquidity to help the U.S. private sector broadly and U.S. banks specifically finance U.S. government deficits. And, you know, my guess is this is why Powell sounded so dovish last week in Paris after having been sequentially more dovish all year and, and why you're hearing, quote, we're never going back to normal 
from Wall Street Journal reporters like Nick Timmerhouse, who tweeted the following about Powell's speech last week when he, when he said this. For years, Fed officials talked about normalizing monetary policy. But in a speech Tuesday, Powell lays out the reasons why there's no going back to normal. The, quote, unconventional tools used after 2008 will likely become conventional tools in a world of lower neutral rates. And so that was last week. And, and to my eyes, you know, Tim Arouse's comments and Powell's speech are just the latest and most direct comments in a series from Fed officials and reporters to set a narrative here in the first half of 2019. Okay, a narrative about what in the first half of 2019, in your opinion? In my opinion, it's a narrative that the Fed stands ready to supply whatever liquidity the money markets need to finance U.S. government deficits. Okay, so how do you think this is going to play out from here? Well, I, I think it depends critically on path, as, which is always important. And, and by that, I mean, at least in June, investor surveys by you know, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and others we're suggesting that investors were tactically positioned totally wrong for a Fed that's effectively going to begin financing U.S. government deficits in the back half of this year. You know, they were overweight cash, overweight bonds, overweight the dollar, and underweight equities, risk assets, emerging markets, et cetera. But it, it's key to understand that, that when the U.S. government passes the debt ceiling, you know, unless the Fed is supplying significant new dollar liquidity already, we could get a brief period of dollar up sharply and risk assets selling off sharply. And I totally concede that that can happen, but but I'm, I'm not positioned for it. Okay, I'll bite. If you concede that can happen, why aren't you positioned for it? <laughs> it's a great question. You know, tactically, I'm not positioned for it because most investors or at least a quorum of investors are already positioned for it. So I'm, I'm not sure we'll get the kind of move they're positioned, you know, for it, for those that are positioned that way or expecting simply because there's obviously a lot of people there already. And obviously, once the event happens, they'll have to exit those positions. But but more strategically, which is, you know, more our Ballywick anyway, for the back half of 19, I'm not positioned for, for a possible short-term dollar spike related to a debt ceiling increase, simply because by nature of where we stand with global sovereign and corporate leverage, you know, a strong dollar period and risk-off period caused by the passage of a U.S. debt ceiling, you know, driving a bolus of treasury bill issuance and crowding out the U.S. money markets by an even greater amount, which would basically turbocharge the dynamics we've seen all year and, and what we've described today. You know, that type of thing cannot be allowed to persist for very long. And if the passage of the debt ceiling in the absence of enough additional Fed liquidity does drive the dynamics, it should, mechanically speaking, which are dollar up sharply, risk assets off sharply, uh, I'd be fading that dollar rally with both hands and buying risk assets with both hands into that, because all that'll do is force the Fed to become far more aggressive, far faster. Okay, when you say far more aggressive, far faster, please quantify. What do you mean specifically? I mean that if, if the dollar rallied sharply and risk asset markets sold off sharply because of a U.S. debt ceiling deal that accelerated the, the crowding out of global dollar markets effectively, you know, the discussion about what the Fed would likely have to do in the back half of this year would quickly go from where we are today, which is, you know, discussing a standing repo facility and, and rate cuts to, you know, discussing $100 billion plus a month or more in QE, in my opinion, and based on our analysis. Why do you think investors are not focused on a quick QE outcome to any spike in the dollar or, or shop sell-off in, in risk assets from here? You know, in my opinion, it's because of the Voldemort dynamic we described earlier. You know, virtually very few, very few people really understand or believe the combined context of, of the U.S. fiscal position where the U.S. is on pace to issue an incredible $11 trillion in treasuries this year on a gross basis, combined with the five-year-old lack of a foreign official sector, you know, growing bid for treasuries, and combined with FX hedge treasury yields having gone negative last fall. And there's a, a grand unifying theory to all all of this as one of our best relationships on the street has called it. And it's to us, it's very straightforward and it's hiding in plain sight if you know what to look for. And, and that is that in the absence of sufficient foreign private sector demand caused by negative FX hedge treasury yields, there is a lack of sufficient U.S. private sector balance sheet to finance U.S. deficits without Fed help for as long as foreign central banks are not growing their treasury books, uh, they're, they're holding the U.S. treasuries. And our view is this is why Fed funds is ultimately above interest on excess reserves. And this is why, in our view, why the Fed is set to cut rates into a good economy. Any change in your positioning, Luke, from the last time we spoke? 
No, we, we still really like gold, Bitcoin. We still like equities with a value bent over growth, and we're still negative on the dollar. And like I said earlier, we remain cognizant that the debt ceiling dynamics we described earlier could cause this trade to go against us for a very brief time. But for the reasons we noted earlier as well, we think it would only go against us for, for a very brief time, if at all. Well, one final question then, and it's an outlier case, but it's one that could make the trade go very much in your favor. There have now been several big banks, including Goldman Sachs, speculating that, hey, if Donald Trump is unhappy with the strong U.S. dollar, he could direct Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin to bypass the Fed, which would be completely unprecedented in U.S. history. But President Trump has not been shy about doing unprecedented things in the past. He, he could just say, Steve, the hell with the Fed. We're going to directly intervene on my authority in the FX market to weaken the dollar. It's a plaza accord held all inside of the president's head with no consultation with anyone else other than Mnuchin. That certainly is not the base case that anyone is suggesting, but some pretty big players have said that's at least plausible. What's your take and what would it mean if it actually happened? Yeah, I, I think it's very plausible. I think if you look at the president's working group on markets, my understanding of the reading of that is he has very wide latitude to do whatever he wants. And if you look at the exchange stabilization funds balance sheet, I want to say it's like a 70 or 80 or $90 billion balance sheet, which is not to say that's enough to sort of intervene for too long a period of time. But, you know, when you go back to earlier in President Trump's administration, about 2Q17, we were writing about it at the time, but there was a couple of articles by Fred Bergsten and Joseph Gagnon discussing something just like this, that we wanted to move towards an appropriate dollar valuation rather than strong dollar, and that we wanted to talk about it with our key trade partners and that ultimately, if our key trade partners would not acquiesce to uh, a more appropriate dollar trade policy, we might need to intervene unilaterally. And that if we did intervene unilaterally, you know, if we were vocal about what we were doing and when we would do it, markets would take care of the rest. And so, you know, I think it's entirely plausible. You know, it makes the dollar trade a little bit more interesting or the, the short dollar trade, I guess, a little bit more interesting if the government is looking at this as, you know, some starting to eye some level above which you almost have sort of this asymmetric payoff where if they're, they're going to get vocal above some certain level, then boy, that, that makes it a little bit more interesting in, in terms of some of these other dynamics we're talking about, particularly vis-a-vis -vis what we think is effectively the Fed financing U.S. deficits going forward. Thanks for another fantastic interview, Luke. We look forward to having you back on the show in a couple of weeks for another update. Thanks for having me on. It's always great catching up, Eric. Fantastic. And listeners, be sure to stay tuned to your Macro Voices feed this week. We've got some terrific content coming your way on All Stars. We've got Dr. Pippa Malmgren. We've got Julian Brigden coming up. We've also got on our Thursday night flagship podcast, Dr. Peter Warburton as our headline guest. And of course, we've got another fantastic Macro Voices Energy Week on tap. For the Macro Voices Podcast Network, I'm Eric Townsend. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Please register your free account at macrovoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors.
Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices.